Welcome, dear participants, social service providers, employers, employees, people supported from across the European Union. I am uh, Luc Seldero, Secretary General of ESPD, and your moderator for the, today's uh, webinar. A webinar organized to better understand and share what a terrible impact the COVID-19 uh, crisis has had on our sector. And of course, also to explore what role the European Union could play in fighting this crisis. Before starting, I would like to share with you some technical information. This webinar uh, will be broadcasted live on Facebook and will also be recorded and published. We have more than 500 uh, registrations on this platform and many others on other platforms. So it is not possible to make it really interactive and therefore your microphones will be muted throughout uh, the uh, webinar. Still, we will try to make it interactive by launching polls during the webinar so that you can give your own opinion on certain issues that we would like uh, to discuss with you. A box will appear on your screen and then you will have a few seconds to answer the questions and we will show you the results. If you have comments, you can use uh, the chat box at the bottom of your screen and for questions, please use the Q&A button in the control bar. If you want to read what is uh, said in real time, then you can activate subtitles by clicking on the closed captioning button, again, on the control bar on the bottom of your screen. Speech to text in real time to facilitate participation for everybody. Dear participants, this event is a first time ever event. 11 European social services networks, together with two social partner organizations, trade unions and employers uh, organized this event. All in all, we represent well over 200,000 social services active across the European Union. In our webinar, we have three uh, important parts, chapters. We start by uh, listening to the Vice President of the European Parliament and of the European Commission, who will share information with us on what is done, what will be done, and how to anticipate. We will also listen to the academic world, and they will share views with us. In a second chapter, we will um, look at what the real issues are at grassroots level. There are many speakers lined up for you that will bring real life stories uh, to us. And in a third chapter, we will uh, discuss what the European Union could and should do to make uh, our sector uh, able to deal with the effects of this crisis. Not only tomorrow, but also in two years and in five years time. And now without further ado, I would like to hand over to uh, Alfonso Montero to give us a uh, first uh, impression and kicking off this uh, webinar. Alfonso, you have the floor. Thank you, Luke. Uh, good morning, uh, everyone. I hope you can hear me well. Um, I represent the European Social Network, which is an international association of 140 public organizations responsible for the planning, managing, delivering, and inspecting social services across 35 countries. I am very pleased uh, to open this meeting which, uh, as Luke was saying, has been organized as uh, the result of a cooperation of European networks that represent different approaches in social services, but who have a common aim of improving services to improving people's lives. During the pandemic, we've become familiar with the challenges faced by the healthcare system, but social services have also faced significant issues to provide care and support for the most vulnerable in our societies. The role has been and continues to be critical to support vulnerable children and families that have been isolating, or needing emergency services, adults with disabilities and older people in care homes, through domiciliary care teams in their own homes, or to provide comprehensive support for people who are homeless. The social services and social care sectors have been particularly vulnerable to this crisis, with many dependent older adults and care workers affected by the illness. The social services sector represents an important percentage of the global workforce, 
According to Eurostat, in 2018, there were almost 11 million professionals working in residential care and social work activities. This amounts to 4.7% of the total workforce. However, social services and social care have not been particularly and sufficiently recognized during this pandemic. The largest impact we've known so far has been on social care homes. Based on national statistics, the share of care home fatalities range from 37% in Germany to 66% in Spain. Groups of academics have reported that about half of all COVID-19 deaths happened in care homes in some European countries, and they warned that the same efforts should have been put into fighting the virus in care homes as in national health care services. Regional and local authorities and the social services providers with whom they work have warned that they don't have the sufficient resources to provide care and support that is essential for the persons and the families with whom they work. And like it happened during the pandemic, designating social services as essential is crucial to ensure they have access to protective equipment, better resource allocation, and maintaining and adapting social services operations. This meeting takes place three and a half months after the lockdown started. So this is the opportunity to start taking a stock so that the lessons learned can help us to plan and put in place the necessary measures to prepare for future crises. While we acknowledge that social services responsibilities mostly fall at national, regional, and local levels, the EU can lead the way by recognizing the crucial role played by social services in the inclusion of people and communities across Europe due to their nature as essential services. This recognition within EU official communications can pave the way for social services to be part of the European instruments developed to support national governments in the follow-up to the crisis. There has been a health crisis, and it is still a health crisis in several parts of Europe, but this is also a social crisis, and social services will be key to address it. They are needed to support individuals and communities to identify what community resources become available, to help with grief and trauma, to ensure that people have access to basic needs, and to support the recovery process. However, authorities and organizations providing social services are facing increasing challenges to support those in need and to do so in the safest and most adequate way. In this vein, the EU could think of a specific support fund for social services and put in place the necessary measures, for example, through a specific help desk to help those on the ground navigate the system to be able to access it. Looking forward, ensuring the resilience of social services will in turn guarantee the resilience of the people who they support. But this is a sector that is now reaping a bitter harvest of over a decade of failure to adequately invest in them and will therefore need to secure smarter investments. The EU has launched a set of ambitious measures to support recovery through the Coronavirus Response Initiative or through the Future Recovery Plan amongst others, making sure, for instance, that within the plan, there is a specific allocation of 5% for social services will provide those will provide hope for those frontline services that they will be able to access the resources that they need to be able to provide the best possible support in the safest and most effective way. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Alfonso, for setting the scene in such a, such a clear way. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to launch uh, a first uh, poll now. Uh, it, is, it would be good to know who is in the room. Uh, can you please, uh, dear participants, uh, vote on uh, who you are so that we see who we have uh, in this uh, virtual uh, meeting here uh, with us? Uh, you can vote now, and in a few seconds, uh, we will see the result. Please vote now. Thank you very much. Can we see the results, please? Oh, we see... Uh, that uh, service providers and professionals are very well uh, represented and uh, it's good to see that we also have some media and academics uh, amongst us. Very good. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It is now a, a pleasure and an honor to uh, hand over to the Vice President of the European uh, Parliament, Mr. Dimitros Papadimoulis. Um, thank you very much for being with us uh, and please, uh, we're all yours listening to your welcome address. Dear Vice President, you have the floor. Dear organizers, dear participants, thank you very much for your invitation. I would like 
to begin by conveying the apologies of President Sassoli for not being able to be with you and with us today. The President is indeed preparing the difficult negotiations on the multi-annual financial framework. You are nevertheless aware of our commitment, of the commitment of the European Parliament to fight against poverty and against all form, forms of discrimination, particularly when it may be linked to, to disability and gender issues. I am pleased to be able to represent the European Parliament today, the portfolio for which I am responsible as Vice President of the European Parliament covers in particular the issues of gender equality and diversity, a subject that is particularly dear to my heart. The ongoing crisis has taken a very heavy toll on our societies, in particular on the most fragile segments of the population. Moreover, COVID-19 has exposed a long-standing problem in care provision in the EU. This crisis presents different dynamics relative to previous ones, as impacts on labor markets are usually delayed relative to the beginning of the shock. Moreover, labor markets will not function as before once the pandemic is over, and both the nature and the length of the change in labor market dynamics are highly uncertain. The impact of on labor markets is much greater than during the last Great Depression. Small firms, workers in the informal economy, which exist also in the EU, and the youth are disproportionately affected. One in six young workers has stopped working and young people tend to work in hardest hit sectors and earn less on average. Women are also strongly affected as they tend to be disproportionately employed in the service sector. Indeed, the majority of health and social workers are women, therefore more exposed to occupational and health risks. The COVID-19 pandemic poses a serious threat to women's employment and livelihoods as it deepens pre-existing inequalities and exposes cracks in social, political, and economic systems. From access to health services, social protection, and digital technologies to significant rise of domestic violence and unpaid care work, the impacts of COVID-19 are exacerbated for many around the world. Women with caring responsibilities, informal workers, low-income families, and youth are among the hardest hit. In addition, increased and alarming domestic violence during the crisis showed how necessary it is that adequate services are in place and easily accessible. The European Parliament has recently called for an emergency funding to support services not governmental organizations and civil society organizations. The pandemic has highlighted the need to think about occupational and health safety for all workers, even those which, are, which were not traditionally considered at risk. This crisis has exacerbated pre-crisis vulnerabilities. In the context of the recovery package, tens of billions of euros may be made available, and we, fight, we are fighting for that to the 2014 until 2020 ESF through a revision of the 2014 to, uh, and 2020 common provisions regulation in the, constant, in the context of the so-called REACT EU proposal which increases the amounts available under various funds, inter alia for the uh, 2014 until 2020 ESF and provides additional resources of 58 billion euros. The European Parliament continue to advocate towards the Council and Commission 
to take into account to take into account the gender perspective in the COVID-19 crisis and to strengthen the provision of funding for all types of care services. The FAM committee is working for a very detailed report which calls among others for a dedicated European career strategy to improve coordination and cooperation at EU level which together with efficient use of the EU funds can, to, can contribute to the development of quality, accessible and affordable care services. The gender mainstreaming network in the, of the European Parliament has addressed a letter to the highest EU level, Ursula von der Leyen and Charles Michel, to request that the investment within the recovery package, the recovery instrument, are equally distributed among women and men. Gender impact assessment and gender budgeting have to be applied for all funds within the recovery package and particular attention should be paid to the socioeconomic sectors that have suffered the most. Concluding, many initiatives have already been taken and at member states and European levels and the European Parliament is now in the process of assessing the different proposals put forward by, by the European Commission. One thing is for sure, more needs to be done and the European Parliament will ensure to place as a co-legislator innovating and ambitious ideas at the core of the policy decisions supported by the package presented by the European Commission. The most fragile persons must be at the center of the recovery strategy, as they are those who have suffered the most from the crisis. Gender equality and women's economic empowerment in governments and the EU COVID-19 crisis response are, and recovery should be prioritized. Hopefully, this crisis can also be a wake-up call, an opportunity to, decisive, to decisively address in Europe some long-standing shortcomings in particular as regards social and environmental issues. This, there are unique issues and challenges that could worsen mental health for people with disabilities during the COVID-19 crisis. Research on past pandemics shows that disabled people find it harder to access critical medical supplies which can become even more challenging as resources become scarce. Some people with disabilities report higher levels of social isolation than their non-disabled counterparts. They may experience intensifies feeling on lonely, of loneliness in response to physical distances measures. Social isolation and loneliness have been associated with increases in health disease, dementia, and other health problems. We are here not only to speak, but also to hear you and to cooperate with you. Thank you for very much for your invitation and for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, dear uh, Vice uh, President. And uh, we count on you and on the European Parliament to work with us on uh, further valorization and recognition of this uh, important sector, uh, as we uh, said already in the opening uh, statement. Thank you very much for your contribution. Uh, before turning to the next speaker, I would like to launch uh, a second uh, poll. Can we launch a second poll? It might be interesting to know what, according to the participants, were the most important uh, needs in the social services sector. Uh, you see uh, a few choices there. You can tick more than one box uh, if you want. Can you please vote on what the most urgent needs were uh, the past uh, few months? Please close the voting and give us uh, the results. Okay, uh, protective equipment, staff related uh, issues and costs uh, as uh, coming out as the most important element and then uh, infrastructural issues. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. 
Uh, we now turn to uh, Vice President of uh, the Commission, Vice President uh, Dubravka Switcha, who uh, is uh, also very committed to, to, to the discussions we are having here today. Uh, it is uh, a pleasure to welcome you at this webinar, dear uh, Vice President. Uh, you have the floor. Please unmute yourself. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to address you online summit today. I appreciate that via this uh, channel we continue our dialogue that we started at the height of this crisis a few months ago. All present here today agree on the importance of social services. The Commission is no exception. We are determined to implement the European pillar of social rights, which enshrines people's right to access quality services. Few will disagree that the current pandemic makes implementation more necessary than ever before. COVID-19 has clearly taught us that the importance of effective access to services. We have seen uh, how the most vulnerable in our society, the disabled, the elderly, the homeless, those in poverty and others have suffered as their access to social services was cut due to measures to curb the spread of the virus. Indeed, the current crisis creates unprecedented challenges to our health, our economy, and our social well-being. Some are more at risk than others, especially the elderly and people with a, dis with a disability. The same is true for those who provide services to them. Social services are under particular strain and the Commission is committed to help. A short time ago, together with uh, Commissioners Nicholas Schmidt, who is responsible for jobs and social rights, Stella Kiriakides in charge of health, and Helena Dali, responsible for equality, we had a discussion with organizations focusing on social, social services to the elderly and people with disabilities. We are listening to the social sector. We have taken actions and continue to uh, assess the different instruments and possible solutions to support both providers and users of social services. This is a challenging task for all of us and we must reflect together on the ways forward in the short term, in the medium term, and of course, in the long run. Dear participants, dear ladies and gentlemen, uh, when we think about the most immediate challenges, we think about how the current pandemic changed our lives and our way of life suddenly and dramatically. It affected all EU member states and the entire world. Because of the pandemic, unemployment will likely increase from 6.7% to 9% this year. European economy is forecast to, con to contract by 7.5% also this year, according to the Commission's Spring 2020 economic forecast. This means that the most vulnerable in society will feel the impacts of this disease through, through no fault of their own. Existing inequalities are exasperated, exasperated. Let's take a moment to compare and contrast. The economic recession over the period 2008 to 2013 triggered the fall in the living standards of poor people of more than 10% per year in Portugal, Italy, and Ireland. In Spain, it was 25% per year and 40% per year in Greece. Today, the COVID-19 epidemic has the potential of generating even deeper effects with GDP falls of minus 1.3% in Ireland and Portugal, minus 2% in Spain and Italy, and minus 6% in Greece. And the signals we are getting from the organizations on the ground corroborate these findings. Service providers and users have reported on the elements affecting the continuity of their services. The lack of personal protective equipment, as we saw in your, uh, uh, in your poll now. Unstable funding, lack of planning and guidance from public authorities, information and communication chaos, all were mentioned. Many of these issues stem from the fact that nobody was prepared for this kind of pandemic impact. In order to address the most immediate impacts of the pandemic, we have taken a number of measures, many of them with social services and other key services in mind. This concerns both funding questions and guidance for activities on the ground. Our first quick response to the crisis was the Coronavirus Response Investment Initiative, as you might remember, 
and the Corona uh, Response Investments Initiative 1 and 2. In a nutshell, both packages focus on increasing the scope of cohesion and other relevant funds and allowing member states to rapidly redirect funds towards COVID-19 related measures with the aim of delaying the spread of the virus and protecting the of, uh, employment levels. This amounts to about 8 billion euros from the European budget, which member states will be able to use to supplement, to supplement 29 billion of structural funding. Moreover, up to 28 billion of unallocated structural funds from the existing national envelopes and including national contributions should be fully eligible. Let me add. Let me add here that I welcome very much that together you and us, we have been able to organize a webinar on 3rd June to bring together all relevant actors at national and European level to engage in a constructive dialogue. This has helped to exchange innovative ideas on how to use the uh, Corona response instrument and to ensure the continu continuity and quality of care and support services. It is crucial that the measures we have taken actually reach you to unfold these effects. Inspired by the partnership principle, this activity enables starting a stable and truthful cooperation to jointly plan and design the ESIF funding opportunities, addressing both the short and long-term challenges of social services across European Union. European Centre for Disease Control has produced guidance for healthcare facilities and providers on infection prevention and control measures for the management of the COVID-19 infection in healthcare settings, including long-term care facilities. Following our exchanges with you, specific ECDC guidance on infection prevention and control of COVID-19 in long-term care facilities was published. There is specific guidance for assisting living facilities, residential care homes, or other facilities that, they, that take care of people require, requiring support. Residents of these facilities are a vulnerable group as many, uh, uh, as many are disproportionately affected by COVID-19 compared to other groups, as evidenced by the large numbers of outbreaks reported, especially in long-term care facilities for older persons. The CDC has also provided guidance on prevention, preparedness, and management of COVID-19 in migrant communities and migrant asylum seek camps. This report, that was uh, this report that was published on 15 June includes population-relevant aspects of, on, of infection uh, prevention and control, contact tracing, risk communication, and community engagement. Concerning the medium and long-term impact of the COVID-19 pandemic, the demand for targeted, targeted social services will likely increase. This reason, the reason is that the hardest hit are people already at the bottom of income distribution. On the other hand, targeted social services working with these groups were already suffering from sustainability, human and financial resources problems before the crisis hit. The COVID-19 crisis demonstrates that business continuity of these services requires more work. More specifically, critical, essential, and non-essential functions of these services should be established. We will also need to consider which services or practices, which services and practices could be shifted online. And last but not least, we will need to reflect on the overall quality standards. It is beyond doubt that the COVID-19 pandemic shows us the importance of solidarity. With this in mind, for the medium-term horizon, the European Commission proposed a plan to lead us out of the crisis and into sustainable, sustainable long-term economic growth based on a green transition and a digital transformation. Therefore, we recently announced a comprehensive package for European recovery with its overall budget of 1.85 trillion euros, 1.85 trillion euros. This will help Europe to recover. Major initiatives like Next, Next Generation EU will boost the EU budget in the first crucial years of the recovery and contribute together with the reinforced budget for 2021 to 2027 to making it sustainable, inclusive and fair. On, on the basis of solidarity, together we will exit the crisis. 
I would now like to address some key elements of the amended European Social Fund Plus proposed for 2021-2027. While the ESF Plus broadly covers future challenges in employment, education, and social inclusion, the impact of COVID-19 outbreak on the fabric of society has prompted the adjustment of ESF Plus proposal to the new reality. The Commission adjusted the budget proposed for the ASF plus shared management strand. There are no changes to the employment and social innovation strand. This means that European Social Fund Plus is proposed to have a budget of 86 billion euros in 2018 prices or 97 billion euros in current prices. Given COVID-19, it is imperative to support vulnerable people and those facing a higher risk of social exclusion. The revised ESF Plus proposal introduces a requirement that each member state invest 5% of ESF Plus resources to address child poverty. It is vital to target this vulnerable group to ensure that no child is left behind in the aftermath of the COVID-19 crisis. With an eye on to the future, along with my colleague, Commissioner Nicholas Schmidt, we want to look into long-term care. The COVID-19 pandemic has shown how some members of our community work in precarious conditions. I'm talking about 70% of staff in the health sector, with the majority working in care services. The demand for long-term care will increase. The provision of sufficient access to long-term care services of good quality is also recognized by the European Pillar of Social Rights. We will also need to look into the situation of care workers. As we age, our needs are greater for such services. The professions must become more attractive for those interested in it. We need to look at income, working conditions, training and funding. We also need to look into the voluntary sector and see how we can support it. It harbors enormous potential, both the benefit of those that need care, as well as providing meaningful activities in those who get engaged. Dear participants, we know the care sector has an enormous potential for job creation, and yet we have seen how care workers, mainly women, work in precarious conditions. We have witnessed how older people could have been better protected. Last January, the Commission launched an open consultation on the action plan. We are seeking the input of stakeholders on principle 18 of the plan, namely long-term care, but also on minimum income. The crisis has put enormous pressure on households' income. Poverty is likely to increase, and so additional measures are required to address the existing gaps in social protection systems. If we are serious about fighting poverty, if we want to build a cohesive and resilient society, then we need to root out poverty. This means addressing child poverty and investing in children. The Commission intends to come forward with a, propor with a proposal on this in the first half of 2021. On the subject of disability, the Commission plans to present a new and strengthened European disability, disability strategy in 2021. While the Commission is currently reflecting on this strategy, I can tell you that it will be based on the United Nations Convention on the Rights of People and Disabilities, the European Pillar of Social Rights and Sustainable Development Goals. People with disabilities can benefit from an independent lifestyle and accessible environments and responsive support. And I also see a strong link between the democracy and demography strengths of my portfolio. We need to address demographic challenges as their impact can already be felt throughout the European Union to varying degrees, be it in, be it in increasingly depopulated regions or declining workforce. We will not and cannot afford to leave anyone behind, not during normal times and much less when facing crisis. We will also need to assess the sustainability of our social protection system to assure intergenerational fairness in the face of an aging population. The manner in which COVID-19 has infected our European Union shows now more than ever that democracy and democratic institutions have a key role to play. Citizens have been asking for greater participation in policymaking and we need to listen to this call. 
participative and deliberative democracy tools can help you know, these tools, participative and, uh, de and deliberative democracy tool, they can help to reinforce democracy in the European Union. An additional tool at our disposal is the Conference on the Future of Europe. Now, Council has adopted its position, as have the European Parliament and the Commission. We can, uh, of course, all three institutions, so we can take next steps to launch the conference. So it was uh, yesterday, uh, it was uh, adopted much, yeah. By, yeah. by Council. So I'm very happy you are the first uh, uh, audience to listen to this. Of course. Having already held many dialogues with citizens, I'm convinced that issues such as healthcare and the EU response to the public health crisis will now have a more prominent role in the conference and in the dialogues among citizens. To conclude, uh, let me take this opportunity to thank EASPD for the work they do in promoting the use of over 70,000 social services and their umbrella associations. There are over 80 million people with a disability throughout our European Union. Each one deserves to have their voice heard. E e ASPD to promote equal opportunities for them through effective and high quality services systems. I invite you and your members and organizations to bring your ideas and reflections to the conference on the future of Europe. Organize events around the conference in your respective villages, cities, and regions. Share your recommendations and your ideas. When our online digital platform is launched, please submit your contributions online. You have a voice and you have policymakers who want to listen with a view to making the best policy decisions possible with an eye on both the present and the future. Thank you very much for uh, listening to me. Thank you very much, uh, dear uh, Vice President. Thank you for your um, uh, agenda for cooperation that you launched. Uh, indeed, we are available to cooperate with you to further develop uh, a social Europe. And also thank you for your kind words uh, addressed to, to ESPD. But as you know, this webinar is also organized by other uh, social service uh, provider networks active at uh, European level. But again, thank you very much for your contribution. Let's now turn, uh, dear participants, uh, to an academic uh, and an academic perspective on what this uh, crisis uh, might mean for Europe and for its social policies. Uh, it is with pleasure that I uh, give the floor to uh, Professor uh, Frank uh, van den Broek from the uh, University of Amsterdam. Uh, Frank, uh, you have the floor. Thank you, Luke. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, we need not convince each other uh, how important social services are for European citizens. Uh, and in recent years, the European Union and its member states uh, subscribed to their importance in a very forceful way. And let me first recapitulate that. Uh, the EU launched in 2013 the so-called Social Investment Package. The social Investment Package was a bundle of initiatives the core idea of the social investment package back in 2013 was that well-organized social policy is an investment in the resilience of our society. And obviously, social policy comes with a cost, but it also generates important benefits. And the social investment package of 2013 particularly underscored the role of social services. Then in 2017, four years later, uh, the Commission, the European Parliament, the Member States together proclaimed the European Pillar of Social Rights, which is basically a set of principles to guide the social development of our societies and an agenda for action. Now, if, if, if you read the European Pillar of Social Rights, you'll immediately see that there are at least five of the 20 principles in that pillar that directly refer to the role of social services. And let me very quickly uh, quote them. Uh, principle 11, saying that children have the right to affordable early childhood education and care of good quality. 
principle 16 on healthcare. Everyone has the right to timely access to affordable, preventive, and curative healthcare of good quality. Principle 17 on people with disabilities, saying that people with disabilities have a right to services that enable them to participate in society. Principle 18 on long-term care. Everyone has the right to affordable, good quality care services. Principle 19 on housing and homelessness, and I will not quote it, I guess you know it. When the pillar was launched in 2017, there was some skepticism about it. So some people said, well, this is just, again, cheap talk. Will it have real bite? Question mark. I was among those who considered the pillar initiative as meaningful and potentially very promising. And more precisely for me, the solemn proclamation of the pillar marked a point of no return. And back in 2017, I wrote that the pillar may become a policy agenda that sustains real momentum. However, if the union fails to deliver on the promise enshrined in the pillar, these initiatives will backfire, the frustration it will generate will undermine any new attempt to equip the EU with a comprehensive social dimension for a long time to come. End of quote, written in 2017. And indeed, I think we are now really in that point of no return. Uh, the corona crisis is a stress test for the actual resilience of our societies. It is a stress test for the resilience of our social services in particular and a stress test for the real significance of the European pillar of social rights. And given the timing, um, I will not uh, repeat what has been said on the very severe impact on social services of COVID-19, both directly and indirectly, and how COVID-19 exacerbated a number of existing challenges with regard to staffing, training, funding, working conditions, you name it. Um, I think social services need an ecosystem that enables them to fulfill their role, funding, staff, etc., strategic preparedness, and the EU is part and parcel of that ecosystem. I think the Commission uh, merits praise for its different initiatives, the joint procurement agreement that was mobilized to, to, to procure uh, protective equipment and other medical countermeasures already in March, the Corona Response Investment Initiative and the Corona Response Investment Initiative Plus, REACT EU. The Commission has been talking about this. I hope member states will fully support those initiatives. I have two worries and two additional remarks. The first worry is, to what extent are we assured that social services, which also account for a large chunk in actual employment, obviously, in the member states, to what extent are we assured that social services will receive their fair share of the funds made available by all these initiatives? And I think Alfonso uh, Montero already in his introduction mentioned the idea that maybe we need really a dedicated share of these extra resources for social services, a kind of European emergency fund for social services. I think that that idea merits real attention. Secondly, I have a worry with regard to timing and implementation. Uh, REACT EU needs agreement. It must be discussed with the Parliament and the Member States. This will take time. Um, then there will be time needed for implementation. And so I'm worried about the timing needed both for the decision making and then the implementation on the ground. And the question for Commission and Member States is how can we speed up the process so that people in the field really feel a tangible impact as soon as possible? Next to these two worries, I have two more general remarks. Uh, which are maybe a little bit outside your initial agenda, but I would nevertheless like to make those remarks. First general remark, if the EU has to play a role, it is certainly in the domain of the procurement of 
vaccination and medical countermeasures in general. It's not a good idea that member states each go it for themselves. Procurement of countermeasures is exactly something where the EU can play a very important role. And there is a framework, it's a joint procurement agreement, and it has been used by the Commission in March to, to uh, launch procurement for medical countermeasures, notably protective equipment. I think it is very important for people in social services that they, they insist with their governments, first of all, that they really collaborate in the framework of these kinds of, of, of initiatives and notably the joint procurement of protective equipment. It makes no sense for member states to each try to solve that problem for themselves. If the EU would have a well-functioning joint procurement system for protective equipment, that would in a preventative sense be extremely important not to repeat what we've seen in March and April in terms of shortages and sheer lack of availability of protective equipment. And my second remark is a more general one. A building on this idea of the importance of joint procurement of protective equipment. Joint procurement of protective equipment, in a sense, is, is really preventative. It is establishing a corporation that is ready to act immediately when a crisis hits. So more generally, I would say that the current crisis underscores the need for mutual assistance schemes that are available, ready to act, ready to be launched immediately when a severe crisis hits. You may know that I've been working on the idea of a European support for national unemployment insurance schemes, a kind of European reinsurance, a kind of second tier insurance, second tier support for the national systems of unemployment insurance if we would have had in February, March, such a system in place, it would have immediately reacted and support would have come immediately without long negotiations and without long bureaucratic processes. So I think that next to the specific agenda which you addressed today, which is specific to social services, the joint procurement of medical countermeasures at EU level and also more generally, the idea that the EU should be equipped with uh, schemes that are launched immediately when a crisis hits is important. I'll stop there. Thank you for listening. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Professor uh, uh, Van den Broeke. Uh, clear and to the point, uh, as always, thank you for your perspective. Indeed, uh, this corona crisis is a stress test for the social services sector, for the social policies uh, we have. You made a point with regard to, to uh, the emergency fund and the fact that the crisis is now. And indeed, uh, you opened a sort of a perspective on the role of the European Union in this regard. Thank you very much for your contribution. Dear participants, it is now time to listen to those that can bring in grassroots uh, realities. I would like to, to invite uh, all the panelists of the first panel uh, to unmute their microphone so that we can go swiftly from uh, uh, one to another and listen to your experiences. And I would like to start with um, uh, handing over to, to Gunta Anka from Latvia. She is uh, representing also the Latvian umbrella body for uh, disability organizations. Um, Gunta, uh, what type of uh, impact has uh, COVID-19 has on social services uh, for you or, or for uh, the people in Latvia. You have the floor, Gunta. Okay, good morning, everybody. I can hope you hear me well. And uh, of course, the COVID situation is uh, quite difficult in my country. Even it's a small country, and even we don't have a very severe COVID situation. Uh, a lot of daycare centers or all kind of daycare centers was closed for people with disability. Also, a lot of uh, uh, care at home was closed for those people because of the COVID situation. And it means for many people, they should stay at home. And it's not even for those people, but we should speak also about the families, which means that families should stay at home to help those people who cannot get the support and services. Okay. The other big problem was uh, 
financial situation because if the service is closed, the people, the staff of the service cannot get money because they are not paid for the service which is not provided. And uh, quite a lot of staff just left the job. So we are not sure what's happened next, what will be the next step because if the job uh, if there is no staff, we cannot open uh, services anymore. Yes. The, one of the biggest problems was that people with mental health problems, because uh, everything should be explained for them, and the situation was very heavy because there is no any kind of additional support to those people because they need additional services at that moment. It's a very, very short recognition of the situation in my country. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Gunta. Uh, let's let's go to Bulgaria. Uh, Maya, you uh, you uh, run a, a service. Uh, what what was the impact of the crisis on, uh, on 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 your service and on the people that you support? Please come in. Hello, uh, hello to everybody. Um, thank you for uh, inviting us here. We are Karen Dom from Bulgaria. We are a foundation uh, that, with a team of over fifty people, we support about three hundred families. Uh, on annual basis, mainly children with special educational needs, children with disabilities or any kind of uh, developmental challenges. Uh, the impact of COVID for us, it was very tangible. We have completely switched to digital consultation and therapy online since day one. And we now are starting to slowly go back to a mix between uh, offline and face-to-face -face work, but we really need to underline several things here. Um, digitalization sometimes is a lux, it's a really luxurious thing, especially in regions where disability equals poverty. And I really would like to underline this because uh, sometimes we speak digitalization as something that is a choice. In many situations it is not a choice because you cannot afford it. Uh, many communities and many foundations such as ours didn't actually have the digital power from day one to start, so it was in a hand uh, on the shoulders of the families and on the shoulders of the therapists themselves how to switch and how to do this uh, change it was really a human a human choice and i would not even go towards if digital consultation is like as good as face-to-face -face consultation for sure that's not the case but for sure on the other hand it's better than having three months of no consultation and no therapy yeah. at all uh, what these months honestly proved to me is that for sure our work is essential and we have also experienced many staffing issues. For example, many people currently focus only on the physical aspects of how COVID affects you, but also the mental state of people who have to uh, support other people with disability. It's very crucial and I think that with us, we really tried also to take care of our team in these difficult times so they can take care properly of everybody else. Yeah, yeah. And I would just like to conclude with something. I know that I have the, the strict two minutes, but for me, like the children and families with the disabled children are one of the most affected. And we really need to take this very clear to everybody because as humans, we need to be responsible, caring, and very much goal-oriented, but also policymakers and stakeholders need to have the same attitude. Thank you very much, Maya. Point, uh, point well taken. Very important. Let's let's go from uh, from Varna, Bulgaria, to uh, to Stockholm, Sweden. Uh, Maria uh, Mannerholm, Sweden had has its own approach to to the COVID crisis, uh, but still, what was the impact on uh, your services, service for uh, older people in uh, in Stockholm? Maria, please uh, come in. Thank you. I'll try and give you a short overview of uh, what's happened here in Stockholm. Stockholm experienced an early spread of the COVID-19 virus. And elderly over the age of 70 were advised to avoid social contact and isolate themselves. Uh, within the home care service sector, we educated special teams and they were established and used in situations where there are suspected cases of COVID-19. This not to spread the virus among the home caretakers. We've thus seen a very limited spread of the virus for elderly living in senior housing or living independently with home care. But the big challenge for the elderly care sector has been that although a national ban of visiting nursing homes were introduced quite early on, sadly the virus still made its way into the care homes. Residents of care, elderly care homes in Stockholm are almost entirely made up of people of a very high age 
suffering from advanced dementia or having severe somatic symptom disorders. It should be mentioned that the majority of deaths among elderly occurred within this group. There's not been any lack of intensive care in Stockholm or Sweden as a whole, but for this vulnerable group, intensive care has not in general been beneficial. This has led us to take many precautions to prevent the spreading of the virus in the nursing homes. Together with the dedicated work of the staff in the care homes, these actions have had a major impact and the number of infected people is steadily decreasing now. Um, I will finalize my short report from Sweden by giving you three examples of actions taken now. Uh, we have focused heavily on informing and educating staff on basic hygiene routines. This includes new information videos on both hygiene routines and use of protective equipment. We have established a new organization to secure purchase, stores, and distribution of protective equipment. Mm -hmm. We have initiated specific short-term care homes for elderly already infected with COVID-19 in order to prevent the virus from spreading within the care homes. These short-term facilities have especially proven their worth in cases of older people that are difficult to isolate um, while infected, for example, elderly with dementia. Okay. That was a short report from Stockholm. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much, uh, Maria. Uh, let's, uh, let's go to, uh, to the Czech Republic. Uh, Romana, uh, you, uh, you provide services in the Czech Republic. Uh, the Czech Republic closed down uh, quite quickly. Uh, how were you impacted? How was your service impacted and your service users? Hello and greetings from, from Czech Republic. Uh, we are a country with 10 million inhabitants and yes, we closed down quite quickly and decided for a number of preventive and prote protective measures. Uh, it had, of course, impact to provision of social services. Some services were stopped for a period of time uh, and uh, or the provision was limited to some basic care. Uh, it was under the decisions of the government, but our people in Sleska Diakonia, they were uh, during the whole period close to the clients. So we were really in direct care, in frontline uh, care. And uh, nowadays, the general measures were stopped, more or less, and we are almost back to normal life. And uh, what we can see uh, is uh, the quite strong impact to economic life of the country and private lives of the people, their psychosocial situation. And this is uh, something that we want to handle for uh, the near future. Uh, and the economic impact will have a long-term nature until the various sector will recover from the shocks. And uh, in this matter, it is very important also for social services sector to be recognized and visible as one of those who were strongly impacted by the crisis and one of those who are also key players in the country in handling the crisis situation. So. Uh, I'm sure that the staff in social services belongs to the first line help in crisis situation. And therefore it is also essential to ensure adequate support for staff in social services and for sector itself. So that's what we are uh, trying to deal with now. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, uh, Romana. Um, different uh, subsectors of the social uh, services field where uh, uh, impacted, of course, by COVID-19. Let's now maybe listen to a brief report from Mauro from uh, uh, Belgium, uh, working with people living in, in, in poverty and uh, in homelessness. Uh, Mauro, please come in. So uh, I don't know if there's a question, but anyway, uh, so when the lockdown started, the Brussels homeless sector was in panic. So services, they, they didn't have masks, nor any other security material. And of course, social distancing was not an option for most of the outreach world services, day centers, emergency shelters, and shelters in general. Almost all day centers uh, shut down or limited the number of people who could access their services, which meant that suddenly homeless people did not have access to hygiene, nor to food. An additional challenge uh, at the beginning of the lockdown was the absence of testing. So, and of course, as you, uh, as you might imagine, uh, there were not enough places to house homeless people. So with the lockdown, even more people were with no accommodation solutions because shelters had to limit the number of people accommodated or simply blocked the new entries. 
So uh, the homeless sector reacted, and since so most of the shelters could not confine people with COVID symptoms within their services, confinement centers were quickly set up by the Red Cross and Doctors Without Borders, as well as a health uh, service uh, run by the organization for which I work. So around 10 general practitioners uh, volunteered to examine homeless people who had symptoms, and when the GP40 was needed, uh, Brussels, Brussels uh, will take in charge the transfer uh, of the person concerned to a confinement zone. And then conventions were stipulated between hotels and public authorities or homeless services. There are more than 10 hotels and most still are uh, used, among which one for victims of domestic violence. One of these hotels, which hosts uh, vulnerable women, is in reality a building provided to the Semus Social by the European Parliament. A big day center run by Médecin du Monde, together with a few other partners, opened up in a youth hostel. Uh, masks uh, provided by public authorities were centralized by Bruxelles and distributed to services. And then during the month of May, testing of homeless services uh, finally took place. Out of more or less 2,000 homeless people, 6% tested positive, which is higher than the rest of the population, but not as catastrophic as we would have thought at the beginning, uh, which means that services in a way reacted pretty well. So all in all, thanks to funding that was provided by the Brussels region, the crisis uh, was relatively well handled. For many, a solution was found, but, but unfortunately, because of structural problems already existing before the crisis, there were nonetheless people left behind. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Mauro. And that's indeed a sort of a across Europe type of observation. Uh, weaknesses of, uh, of the sector come out, uh, of course, uh, much stronger in, in times of crisis. Uh, let's turn to, to Denmark, uh, to Hella Christensen. Um, Denmark is, is well known for having a, a quite strong uh, welfare system. Was there an impact of uh, the COVID-19 uh, crisis uh, on services for poor people in, uh, in, uh, in Denmark? Yes, um, Corona crisis has been a, a stress test, but also a magnifying glass. When the whole country is sent home, it comes very clear if you are homeless and have nowhere to go. No people in the streets means no bottles or cans to collect, no one to sell the homeless newspaper to. And when the whole country is told to stay indoors with the closest relatives, it becomes very clear that you have no relatives or friends to be close to. Isolation and fear invade you around the clock. Drinking and other addictions are ways of seeking escape in that situation. So Corona crisis is like a magnifying glass. Loneliness, mentally and physical diseases, addiction, poverty, all have been more obvious to the people affected in Denmark. We in Dan Church Social is present in the local societies in Denmark and is trusted by poor and vulnerable. We help with the basic things to live for poor and homeless and excluded people. And as it comes out, agility is a word and an ability to underline that the social service providers have agility. We possess that and it made, that, it made it possible to adjust very quickly and meet the needs. We and other organizations were there before the crisis and during the crisis and has been able to adjust our work. Day shelters changed to shelter to go with portable food and drink, wagons with toilets, distribution of power banks, you can charge your phone in the woods or in the streets. Night shelters were kept open and with all the protective equipment and space between the mattresses meant that fewer people could get in. In the poor families, the children were at home now or around the clock and supposed to be taught by the parents. Many families cannot do that. They are isolated and suffering mental health problems and poverty. We provide food and activity boxes for the family and in good distance also talk to them about their problems and let them know that we were still there. Yeah. People were scared and turned to us for information. Yeah. 
Thank you very much uh, for your for your contribution, uh, and, and thank you for for bringing up this this metaphor of uh, well, it's it's more than a metaphor of of the the magnifying glass. Indeed, that is absolutely correct. Uh, I think. Uh, let's turn to to Spain now. Uh, Hilde Dams, um, you work with, uh, with with children and families. Uh, share with us uh, how the crisis impacted uh, uh, your support system. Yes, good morning. Yes, in, um, in Spain, like in several other European countries, children and youngsters were the forgotten during the first months. Even more, they were the perpetrators no, of transmitting the virus, so they had to be confined, isolated in houses, without education, without playgrounds, without friends. And so schools also were closed very, very even before the lockdown was ordered, eh, without an adequate uh, preparation and planning. So, and also the contradictions in the messages regarding the opening created a lot of uncertainty among uh, children and youngsters. We said that during these months, more discussion raised up in society on when football could be restarted, then children could go back to the school. Eh? It's, uh, it's very important. This. So as Caritas in Spain, we try to offer a counterweight to this situation. We support families and their children in vulnerable situations. It's more, more, it's like the same like uh, was telling Helle before, no? Uh, families who are experiencing extreme forms of poverty. And as Caritas Spain, we, we support every year like 20,000 children in specific programs on a comprehensive way. So, on, um, so with the COVID, what we did on the one hand, we try to ensure this right to food and we doubled the support on families with children in this way. Uh, it's, a, it's the same now, the magnified glasses, uh, it's, uh, it's also in this way. Uh, and on the other hand, we tried to mitigate the impact of the crisis in youth. Um, they feel, felt very isolated you know, in their houses, sometimes with um, violent situations in their houses. So we sued the contacts during these months with calls, WhatsApp, delivering copies of homework, following up with the parents, but also the emotional support as an important element in these times. We think it was sometimes forgotten. What is the impact also for the children and the youngsters uh, living uh, so isolated, no? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, last element is, uh, like you know, Spain is one of the countries with the highest school dropout rates in Europe. And it's feared that uh, this may be increased considerably due to the COVID, uh, especially in those families living in precarious situations, small houses, rented rooms, having precarious jobs, a lot of times in formal economy, without the possibility to assure a good follow-up of these learning processes. And we say always, uh, because of this digital gap, many young people we support have been disconnected uh, since March 14th. So it was for Caritas really a big challenge to continue with the school support, resilience and reinforcement. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Hilda, for this uh, for this contribute, contribution and for pointing out pointing out the, the situation of, of of the children in, uh, in in your in your region in your country. Uh, before uh, going to the last speaker, I would like to remind you that you can use the chat box. There is a very lively debate going on in in the chat box, so feel free to uh, to use it and to share your opinion and ideas uh, with us. Uh, uh, by using the chat box as well and um, Thomas Bignell who is uh, working in the background is also providing uh, links to important documents and, and strategy that were mentioned already so you can find additional information in the chat box as well. Let's go from Spain to uh, Romania. Uh, Anna uh, I hope that you are that you are with us. Anna is also a chairperson, president of the International Federation of Social Workers, and she works on training uh, and skill assessments uh, in uh, Romania. Uh, could you could you share your uh, uh, your um, information with us, please? Uh, Anna, you have the floor. Hello to everybody. Thank you very much, uh, Luke. Uh, from the very early stage of pandemic in Romania, we've learned that uh, problems worsen quickly in a very short time. Uh, and the number of people that needed support went up very fast. Problems like school closures, food shortages, job loss and job insecurity, uh, social isolation affected all the family. Uh, but cumulated in a total disaster for a family with a low income or a family living in the rural area. A number of people with a special uh, need for care 
uh, lost the support of uh, they usually receive from their families and the number of uh, child support services had to suspend their home visit. The result of this uh, situation was a dramatically increase of pressure on uh, public community services. On the other hand, we find out that uh, the traditional way to provide support had to change overnight. We faced a number of challenges, the need for innovation and adaptation of social services, the need for high professional answer to complex problems, lack of recognition of the value of social services by the state and consequently their adequate financing, and the fact that a number of family and children was, were excluded from services, as my colleague said, due to the lack of digital equipment and skills to use digital tools. I would say that we couldn't rely on solid funding policy ensured by the state. And um, even we realize how important and essential these services, these social services uh, are. And in fact, uh, in uh, Romania, the community social services received new responsibility during this COVID-19, uh, but no budget allocation. And this experience it's also in uh, other European countries. Okay, okay. Thank you very much, uh, Anna, for, for sharing that uh, with us. Uh, dear, dear colleagues and participants, before going into a second round with, with our panelists, I would like to launch um, an, an, another poll. So please uh, can, okay, there we go. Um, so we would like to know from you uh, what you think that the medium to long-term needs are in social services. Uh, again, it's multiple choice, so you can tick more than one box, uh, sustainable funding, uh, staffing and skill development, uh, resources to invest in innovation, uh, or uh, other um, activities such as further developing partnerships and so on. Please vote now and share with us your opinion on what uh, medium to long-term needs in social services uh, might be. And do we have results? Um, I think that this is a quite clear outcome and the panelists can uh, take it in consideration when uh, uh, replying to the uh, question I will ask in a second. Uh, it is clearly that uh, sustainable funding is a key issue. And uh, we know by experience that also staffing, of course, is absolutely essential. Thank you very much uh, for your opinion on, on this. Um, I would like to turn back to, to, to the panel now and ask them to, to share with us their, their top priority uh, on what they think that uh, Europe, that the European Union uh, should, uh, should do. Uh, one, max two elements which you think that are absolutely essential that Europe uh, should, uh, should do. And let's uh, start with, uh, with Gunther. Um, what role should the European Union play? What should the European Union do? Please. Uh, we are calm and satisfied with the situation, which we have in Latvia at the moment, because our government make a plan of the recovery so the way how we are going to spend the money coming from Europe and also coming from other sources in our country. And they are, uh, the only part on people with disabilities is a part on employment. And of course employment is very, very important, but employment couldn't be provided without social services. We know all about it and about people with disabilities. So I, I really see that European Union can make some kind of guidelines on which way the, the money made to the recovery of the coronavirus in a country should be used by saying that employment is very important, but for people with disabilities, and I'm sure for many other groups too, it's very important to have uh, more social services because at the moment everything is on the shoulders of local municipalities okay. and it depends on which local municipality you are living in. Is it yep. rich enough so guidance, or not? Guidance from the European level and uh, investment in uh, support systems. So, so, yep. Thank you very much, uh, Gunta. Maya, what would be your top two? 
Um, I, first of all, I, I did vote for the sustainable funding, so my ground stands there very clearly. Uh, I would like to maybe make this metaphor that we always say uh, each crisis is a possibility. I think that on a European level, we also need to consider this. The geopolitical situation between the United States, between China, really, we as Europeans need to stand the ground of what our values are, and our budget needs to reflect our values. Uh, and I'm not speaking only as a metaphor. I really think that there are very concrete things that we need. And for sure, for me, I am currently lacking the guarantee that social service providers are essentials for Europe. And I, as a person who is in charge of a social organization, I would really like to see this as something key for the policymakers on European level. I would really invite them to think of how uh, they can really uh, underline their commitment to, to us and to the citizens of Europe. Okay. Because, yep. yeah, we did a round, but most of us do face the same problems. Sustainable funding and recognition as being essential. Uh, thank you, uh, Maya. Uh, Maria, uh, Stockholm, what would be your suggestion on um, Europe? Maria? You're on. Yes, yeah. sorry. <laughs> uh, yes, I would see that a broader cooperation. In, in Stockholm, we had a huge problem uh, with protective equipment. And in any crisis, I feel that it's uh, the cooperation in uh, ensuring the resources that we need, that all countries need to deal with the situation. That's crucial that the EU has a, a grip together. Um, and that we do not, um, that not every country acts for itself. That is very important. And what we see in Sweden is that the education uh, of the staff is also a major issue that we should cooperate around. Um, as the system is set up in Sweden, we do, don't see a lack of, of funding as our primary problem. But that could, of course, be very different. So, yes. Thank you. Clear investment in, in staff and cooperation across yes. borders and cultures. Thank you for that clear message. Uh, Romana, what would be your top two? Uh, firstly, I'd like to mention the importance of uh, accessibility of the low-scale residential care and community-based long-term care. Uh, we in Sleska Riakoni are providing long-term care mainly in community-based services and we could experience uh, how this helped in overcoming and handle the crisis situation in elderly care. It was also visible how big institutions are vulnerable by the situation like COVID due to concentration of number of fragile people at one place and lack of staff and, and funds. So this is one remark and the other one is the importance of investments in, in long-term care, both in people, staff members, their salary status of the profession, and in infrastructure, technologies, conditions okay. for work. Thank you, Romana. So uh, support in uh, transition and innovation uh, in services and uh, investments. Thank you. Uh, Mauro, what yes. would be your top two? So let me just say that the current situation in Brussels is the following. Around 850 people are accommodated in hotels and more than 1,000 are in emergency shelters. To this number, we should add all those who are sleeping rough, those who are living in squats, and all those who are in shelters or in temporary housing. According to the last Brussels homeless count in 2018, there were 4,187 homeless people. Today, we can safely say that there are more. We will verify that in the next homeless count, which takes place in November. The reality is that most of the people currently hosted in emergency structures have currently no chance to be housed or hosted in other services because of lack of a residence permit, lack of income, mental health. What the European level do, uh, Moro? We now have a minister who committed to shifting to a long-term strategy on homelessness. If pressure on his work was strong before the crisis, now it's even much stronger. And that's where the EU has a role to play. We need a firm commitment and funding to act on homelessness. An effective EU strategy on homelessness will encourage all the local actors who commit on homelessness. It will provide a framework in which it would be easier to make the right uh, steps forward. And that's not only a matter of non-binding measures and funding, as an EU strategy on homelessness would imply, but also for EU law. And I'm referring in particular to EU free, free movement law and EU migration law. 
Okay, thank you, uh, Mauro. So, uh, especially the commitment of the politicians at European level and uh, investment in, in strengthening uh, the, the, the legal frameworks. Uh, let's go for, uh, to, to Hella. Uh, Denmark, uh, Hella, what would be your top two? It is obvious that the, the fact that we were there already was extremely important that we could um, be agile and act in the situation. So uh, resilience in the funding uh, for our, our work is very important. We should not be invented when the crisis hit. We were there already and people could uh, access us and knew us and uh, had faith in that. So funding, securing presence all the time and uh, qualitative, uh, the, qual the qualifications in the work is very important. My organization, we want to, to earn our own money by our uh, second-hand shops, charity shops, but there has to be a security net uh, that uh, ensures that uh, the, the social organization and services are there uh, continuously. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Hella. Um, crisis uh, readiness, preparing for for crises, uh, I picked up, and sustainable funding. Uh, Hilde uh, from uh, Spain, please. Okay, the first that we ask is uh, a European framework directive on minimum income as a right in order to prevent poverty and also in order to avoid the transmission of intergenerational uh, poverty. Spain took a brave decision implementing the income, the minimum income, but unfortunately we see that too many people will not be able to benefit from this measure for the requirements demand. So we think with a European framework it, it could resolve. The second uh, proposal is about uh, child guarantee. Already the vice president of the Euro European Commission made an allusion to it, but uh, we ask that, uh, or we think it would be important not to wait to, till 2021 to move forward in implementing and securing the necessary budget for this child guarantee, because we have also to learn from uh, experiences in other uh, countries who go, went wrong, for example, in the re regional uh, government in Madrid, they, in order to, um, to have an alternative uh, free lunches in school for uh, poor people, no, for poor families, what they did was uh, making an agreement with Telepizza, which is like Pizza Hut, to enable children uh, to eat pizza and chicken nuggets during two months. No, it's, uh, these are not policies who ensure uh, adequate nutrition, free education, free healthcare, decent housing and free early childhood, uh, what is uh, guaranteed by the child guarantee. Okay, thank you, thank you. Uh, Hilde. Uh, a framework directive uh, uh, on minimum income and further developing the child, child guarantee uh, uh, legal framework. Uh, important remarks. Anna, uh, from, from your perspective, what would be your top two? What should Europe do? Thank you very much, uh, Luke. Uh, I support all my, uh, all, everything my colleagues said, and I uh, also look to the comments, and I really enjoy reading it in the meantime. And therefore, I would like to say that uh, what you can do is, first of all, to take care that um, marginalized uh, social work and uh, social services. You know, uh, Ian Johnson, uh, it's really right in his comment that in many countries now we are, uh, we have to take care that social workers are not marginalized and social services are not marginalized. But I have top two uh, because uh, um, I, I mentioned that because I think it's very important that social services have a public mandate, mandate and also that uh, social service ensure that uh, service users receive support as a matter of rights, not as a charity. And this is absolutely important during this time. And um, coming from Romania, I also need to add a third one, please allow me. Uh, <laughs> it's very important that EU activates all control mechanism to ensure that the money is used in a transparent and efficient way if we want that this money are reaching the community level and the social services in our communities. Okay, very clear and thank you very much, uh, Anna. So, uh, recognition as being essential uh, and no charity was the first part of your message and then let's make sure that uh, the spending of the money is, is done correctly and that we try to avoid uh, money going into uh, um, services or, or hands that were not uh, uh, meant to, uh, 
to receive the money. Thank you very much. Um, dear colleagues, uh, dear friends, uh, I think that uh, uh, it is clear if you want me to summarize uh, what was said during this first uh, panel, uh, then uh, it is that uh, social services should be uh, recognized as being essential services. Uh, we uh, need uh, sustainable funding and the crisis is now, so support uh, is needed. Um, of course, you can uh, go back to uh, uh, the recording of this panel uh, later on if you, if you want, but this is my brief summary at this point. Let's start our second panel. Let's start our second panel, and in that second panel, we will uh, maybe uh, dive in uh, a, bit, a bit more in what uh, uh, the European Union could uh, and should uh, do for our sector. Um, we have uh, lined up people that uh, know the, uh, the, the machinery of the European Union quite well, and they will share their thoughts and uh, ideas uh, with us. And I would like to start with um, giving the floor to Maria uh, Neyman. She is Secretary General of Caritas uh, Europa. Uh, Maria, uh, what, uh, what, what are your first reactions to what was brought up by, by the people uh, from, from different corners of Europe? And, and what, how do you see Europe uh, working uh, on this? Thank you very much, Luke. And, and indeed, it was a pleasure to, to listen in this morning to the essential contributions that were made so far. Um, and, and I'm indeed from Caritas Europa and also a board member of Social Services Europe. Um, and uh, I think what, what came across very, very clearly and that I'd like to focus my short intervention on now is the urgent need for action for social services. Uh, we know that uh, universal access to social services is, is essential in the fight against poverty um, and the fight against social exclusion in Europe. Uh, and we also know that uh, social services are a means to allow for the respect of the dignity of, of a person and to enable uh, the access to human rights in practice for the people in need of such services. And we also know that uh, the, the member states that are better equipped, um, for, that have better social services uh, provision, they are better equipped to, um, to address and to mitigate uh, the consequences of the crisis for, for their populations. Uh, and Caritas, we issued um, earlier this year, but that was before the, the, the COVID pandemic, uh, a report giving a snapshot of the situation in terms of access to services in Europe. Um, and it showed that although there has been an improve, uh, improvement in terms of, of access since the financial crisis back in 2008, access to social services still remain problematic in many ways in terms of affordability of the services, adequacy of the services, availability, accessibility, and so on. And we know and we heard that the COVID crisis has further worsened the situation. Um, so the social service providers continue to be really severely impacted by the pandemic. And that's, of course, I mean, partly, um, as we heard, also due to the health situation itself, but also to the consequences of the crisis on challenges that, that were already existing before. So the costs of the service provision have been increasing as well uh, due to the pandemic, the protective equipment, the extra staff costs, the extra investments for adapting services and so on. Uh, but income, so the so costs were increased, but income was decreased. Um, I mean, due to, um, to lack of donations, lack of, of public support and so on. So sustainability of social services is threatened and it's the persons in the most vulnerable situations that are the first victims of that. So addressing the situation is therefore really urgent and, and what we call for as social services providers, um, we call for, urgent, for an urgent creation of European Emergency Fund for social services. Um, so that would allow for direct support uh, for the provision of social services during this period of emergency due to the COVID crisis. Um, so we heard that it's a priority with support, but we are insisting that this is, this is urgent support that we are needing, it's emergency support. And we also call for a permanent health desk, which would, um, which would be created to use the, the coronavirus response investment initiative and other EU funds uh, for more like medium term needs. So member states should give priority to ensuring uh, access to social services for all. And, and, um, and, and to close, I mean, I think member states should make sure to make social service provision crisis proof. And that was also mentioned in the morning because we would have changed the course of events a lot uh, if we had been prepared uh, and if um, there had been this, uh, this uh, social service crisis proofness. 
but that will require public support and it will require investment uh, because social services are essential. I think that this is what comes, comes true through and, and it's part of the solution for inclusive recovery from the crisis that we are facing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Maria, for your very clear message. Uh, emergency fund, help desk, recognition, sustainable funding, uh, all uh, essential for our sector, uh, indeed. Uh, Freik uh, Spinnewen uh, will come in now. He is uh, president of Social Services uh, Europe and also leading uh, Fianza. Freik, uh, please, you have the floor. Uh, good morning, uh, Luc, and good morning, um, participants. Um, uh, it's an honor to um, uh, to be on this panel. Uh, allow me to um, raise a few points in the in the few minutes that I have. Uh, first of all, I want to say, and uh, it has been stated several times, but it's important to uh, to say it again: social services are key partners uh, of the European Union um, to deliver on the uh, EU uh, objectives of social progress and respect of fundamental rights, uh, as they are enshrined in the. EU pillar of social rights. Uh, Professor van den Broeke said earlier on um, that uh, it's impossible for the uh, EU to deliver on the uh, pillar of social rights if they don't work with social services because in at least a handful of the principles, uh, social services are explicitly mentioned. So that's the first point uh, I, I want to make. It's obvious, but uh, I don't think it can be repeated uh, sufficiently. I think we are even more relevant when I say we, I mean social services, uh, than uh, ever before. Uh, and that uh, thanks uh, between brackets of the corona uh, crisis and the social consequences that we expect. Uh, and it's, of course, important to look at the uh, short term impact of the corona crisis. And uh, Maria has spoken uh, about that. But let's not um, uh, get obsessed by the short term impact. We also have to look at the long, long term impact. Like my colleague Mauro Striano said, uh, homelessness has not increased in Brussels, but we expect it to increase in the next years. So we also have to look at the long term impact. And therefore, uh, we need an ecosystem uh, that allows us to thrive, that allows so social services to thrive. Uh, also at EU level, the, 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 the EU has a role and the Vice President of the Commission has actually confirmed that that's uh, uh, the case. That role, um, the EU role has to take due account of the diversity uh, uh, of the social services, but there is things that they can do. Three very quick um, um, proposals. An EU policy framework that uh, uh, provides guidance um, uh, and the ability to monitor progress of social services that helps us to uh, perform um, uh, better. That can probably be pushed through the European semester. I don't want to go into detail. Second, and most important, funding and guidance on how the funding should be used. Uh, we propose that 5% uh, of the uh, recovery facility should be spent on uh, social services. One of the concerns that Frank van den Broeke actually mentioned was that there is no guarantee at the moment that that money would actually end up in the hands of social services. So we have to ring fence 5%. And why not also uh, ring fence 25% of the REACT um, uh, uh, program for social inclusion where social services can play a role. And third, um, the EU can play a role in providing enabling conditions. We have mentioned and we heard people mentioning the need of staff, the need of well-tamed staff. The Commission, the European Union can play a role in that and legislation uh, where necessary. And the very last point I want to make is that we have to have a very good understanding what social services are. When we talk about care, we hear lots of policymakers talking about long-term care, but care cannot be reduced to long-term care. There is also something like short-term care and, and emergency care, and we also have to make sure that those two uh, other forms of care are also fully included uh, in, um, um, uh, in the work on social services and in the way we cooperate with the European Union. Thank you, Luc. Thank you very much, uh, Freik. Thank you very much for your uh, very uh, concrete uh, proposals. Uh, also for stressing again that we need a sort of a facilitating uh, ecosystem for our sector and for uh, explaining again uh, that uh, social services are not only about long-term care there is a huge diversity in types of support that are provided uh, by our sector uh, thank you very much uh, let's let's turn to the to the trade unions uh, uh, also for the workforce, the last few months were very challenging uh, for the people working in the organizations. Uh, Jan Willem, you are Secretary General of uh, the European Federation uh, of Public uh, Services Unions. How do you see all this and, and how do you see the role of the European Union uh, in, in, in the short term and long run? Please, Jan Willem, you have the floor. 
Thank you, uh, Luc, and good morning to, uh, to everybody uh, for being here and also the various contributions which were made by colleagues in the uh, first panel. EPSU organizes workers in all forms of care, including elderly, residential home care, and provided publicly, non-profit or private. And we're working with uh, the social employers, which we heard of later, in addressing major concerns in our sector. Uh, as you said, Luke, many of our workers have been, many of our members have been in the front line, often unprotected, in dangerous circumstances to themselves, to the elderly, the sick, those we care for. And as many of you know here, many workers have also been infected with several hospitals and sadly some of our members have, uh, have died. Uh, so one of the first priorities, of course, from us uh, was that we wanted to ensure that workers have a safe working environment. Uh, it is a responsibility of the employer uh, and uh, with employers we have been cooperating in, in developing safety protocols, etc. But what we were disappointed with uh, from the European Commission is sufficient attention to this, to health and safety and doing all it could uh, to uh, promote this. The procurement, uh, as has been mentioned earlier, uh, was good, but uh, uh, only a small step. One of the things which come out very clearly from the various contribution here in the panel is that the problems of underfunding and understaffing that have existed long before COVID have been confirmed and uh, I think uh, exas exacerbated, enlarged. It is good that the investigations are now started. We also need this at European level uh, also to learn the lessons uh, and certainly what we do not need at European level, also important to say, is a continuation of policies of austerity. Uh, what we are doing at the trade unions within the EQC, our umbrella, is seeking the adoption of a substantial EU recovery plan. Uh, what we are disappointed about, uh, and I think several have mentioned it here, is that the EU recovery plan is silent on how we build and rebuild social services. Uh, and uh, as one of the previous panelists said, it's sustainable funding we need, not charity. Uh, the uh, support for, as also Professor van der Broeke and in this panel, our colleague from Caritas mentioned emergency support, dedicated spending uh, are also uh, policies we support. Uh, we heard earlier the Commission Vice President uh, highlighting the need for better working conditions, etc. Well, an essential part of building a sector, getting recognition for our workers, is to achieve better remuneration, better staffing levels, and for that you need also good collective bargaining and social dialogue. And this is also what we want uh, with the European Commission, from the European Commission at European level and to engage with the unions and employers in the sector on this. Several of you, uh, and including the uh, Vice President of the European Parliament, also refer to addressing the, um, the gender uh, the gender issues and including the gender pay gap. I will not enter into details, but that is certainly something we support. I'll end, look with two final points. The EU pillar of social rights makes very clear that po people have a human right to care. Ensuring that people can enjoy that right requires solid funding for social services. Second, realizing that human rights requires quality of work for the people we care for. And that, of course, links to quality staff with good working conditions. Mm -hmm. So what we do uh, expect from the Commission and Member State is much more than currently is being done. And what we expect from all of us together is that, as somebody in the, panel, uh, somebody in the chat channel also indicated, that together we can build that strong voice for our sector in the lobby work we need to uh, we need to have over the uh, months and years to come. Thank you and thank you all. Thank you very much, uh, Jan Willem, and thank you for the very uh, nice and uh, smooth cooperation we have with, uh, with EPSU. Uh, indeed, uh, we have to invest in, in the workforce uh, uh, in our sector and social dialogue instruments are needed if we want to, uh, uh, to achieve uh, our, our ambition uh, together. Let's turn to the uh, social employers. Because if you have trade unions, then you also should have the employers uh, at the table. And uh, we have uh, Sylvain Renouvel uh, with us here, Director of the Social Employers. Sylvain, you have the floor. Thank you, Luke. Good morning, everyone. Uh, the key messages of the social employers are the first, the fact that uh, we are facing uh, challenges that we faced before the crisis. We are facing the aging of the population, which has been reported by BEC uh, last week. We know uh, increasing social care needs with uh, 
users needing so they are more based on rights uh, and uh, we also have uh, the intention and we have the duty to we implement and to make the European pillar of social rights a reality. At the same time, of, uh, these challenges, which has been uh, increased by the, the crisis, uh, we face uh, challenges in terms of staff. We already talked about it a bit. Uh, we face staff shortages in the sector. We have more needs, but at the same time, uh, less staff to, to do the job. So that's something which is very, very important in all the member states. And uh, to so what we wait for the Commission is to face the, this situation and to recover from the COVID-19 crisis. We need a more an immediate support from uh, to our services. Uh, we need it from the EU. We talked about it, but we also need it from the member states. And the EU has a role to play in this. That's the European semester with the guidance uh, the EU uh, gives to the member states about their uh, priorities. They are, must have in economics, but also in, in the social field. Uh, so that's something important. And as we are uh, services, our budgets are constituted of uh, something like 75% uh, uh, of uh, staff cost. And uh, the lack of funding that we face sometimes uh, cause uh, understaffing. And where we have understaffing, we have problems of attractiveness because too much work, not the uh, question not to make uh, our, your work uh, as, as, as nice as you would like to. So it causes uh, problems also of attractiveness. So that's why uh, together, uh, EPSU and social employers, we are committed to work together to, in the frame of the EU social dialogue to improve the staff uh, conditions the staff situation to be able to provide affordable, accessible, quality services to the ground and across Europe. And uh, to do this, uh, I will give some examples. Uh, during the crisis, we wrote uh, tries to the Commission to highlight the need uh, of uh, continuity of services, uh, also the need of protection of the staff, protection of the users, of course. And uh, we also made a webinar together to, on health and safety issues at the workplace. Uh, with the help of OSHA, the uh, Agency uh, for Health and Safety. And uh, we also uh, happy to, uh, were happy to announce we just agreed on a statement, a uh, joint position of uh, okay. retention. And to conclude, uh, so what we need in three points, uh, that we need, <laughs> <laughs> we need, we need uh, sufficient funding uh, at EU plus level. We have to improve working conditions and highlight the role of social services to make uh, them uh, we recognize that because we are the essential services and help us to develop social dialogue, which can help uh, to face this situation. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sylvain. And uh, it is, uh, I think, uh, absolutely essential that uh, uh, next, next to the fact that all the, the organizations that are involved in the organization of this webinar here are involved in, in civil dialogue, it's good to see that also the social dialogue is really taking off uh, in our sector. Uh, it will uh, help us to further develop uh, uh, the activities and, and the sector. Uh, before going to the last two speakers in this panel, I would like to launch a fourth, uh, a fourth poll. Can we? And there it is. Um, dear participants, uh, your opinion on uh, what you would like to see uh, the European Union uh, doing for our sector. Um, it is multiple choice. But if you are precise in what exactly you want, we would maybe better see what uh, uh, what comes out as the most important uh, elements. You can vote uh, now. Recognition for the sector, urgent support, resilience of the sector, all the above or nothing at all. And can we have the results, uh, there we go. I think that there is a strong majority, a democratic majority, that is saying that we indeed uh, should work on the different uh, elements uh, altogether, uh, because, and that goes back to what was said by the President of Social Services Europe, these are elements of building a uh, ecosystem that allows us to develop our activities. Thank you very much. Um, Let's turn now to Mr. Martins Moors uh, from uh, Riga, uh, Latvia. Um, 
Could you please share with us how you see the role of the European Union in uh, fighting uh, the effects of this crisis uh, in, in, in middle and long term? Please, uh, Martins, you have the floor. Uh, yeah, hello to everybody. And uh, uh, my, I would like to highlight three important things in my, in, in my so first thing is, I think, exchange of experience between social service providers. Of course, EU is supporting that, but I think it should be continued uh, ongoing exchange of experience between social service providers, because situations such as emergencies as COVID, the role of organizations like Europe Social Network is very important. And we saw that it is rapidly exchanging with experience and the, or these organizations is, are adapting to both emergencies and current topics. And I think everybody of us has thought about how others are dealing in the same uh, problematic situation. So I think that sharing of know-how at the local level is second most important thing after the money. Second, uh, my highlight of the point is balancing of the regions and the balancing in according to specific for example, in Latvia, most affected by pandemic were Riga city and it means capital of Latvia and surrounding region. It means that we need to think about different approach to solutions and restrictions in different regions, depending on density of inhabitants and internal mobility of populations. Why I'm saying that? Because sometimes big cities have less access to co cohesion funding, yeah. despite the fact that some problems affect them more than other regions. For example, the time of COVID showed that investment in long-term care infrastructure are also very needed. Overcrowding and its impossibility of distancing was a problem in long-term care institutions. In fact, it means that EU support is also needed for long-term care infrastructure and housing adaptation. Third point is EU role in minimal standards of social services and social assistance too. Uh, although the EU does not intervene in matters falling within the competence of member states, perhaps the EU could do more to address the issue of minimum income levels and promoting social services as essential services. Because there are signs that the views of poor people and other service users are not represented in national politics. For, uh, I'm just uh, referring to the uh, an, uh, analogy before joining EU, certain requirements are set for the countries who want to join, but after the joining, they do not actually take place. So what we do expect from EU in this regard? I think I voted uh, as a recognition as a for the sector. So I think that EU could shape public and political opinion about social services as an investment in economics, people, and sust sustainability of society. Okay. Yeah. For example, in Latvia, the first priority was healthcare services, but social services that provided continuity of care were forgotten in the very first national level decisions. That are my three main points. Thank you very much, uh, Martins, uh, for, for your contribution. Sharing now how investing in social cohesion and making sure that all uh, regions can, uh, can benefit from, uh, uh, from certain initiatives and then in investment in the quality of services. Clear messages. Uh, dear participants, it's with pleasure now that I introduce the last speaker uh, for this uh, panel. Uh, Mr. Dragos Pislaru, who is member of the European uh, Parliament uh, and also member of the Employment Committee in the Parliament. So, uh, on a very important position for us, uh, and I would like to, to, uh, uh, to hand over to you now, uh, Dragos, share your opinion with us and, and tell us what the European Parliament will do to, uh, to take into consideration uh, what was discussed here uh, today. Um, uh, Dragos, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Luke. Um, I would start with, with a personal message, but I think that this is actually conveying what we feel in the European Parliament, um, uh, all, all us uh, colleagues there. Um, after each battle, we actually are counting the wounded, but we also acknowledge and praise our heroes. And the social service providers have been on the front lines of our fight against the pandemic, and they ensure the health and the well-being of the people they serve 
the different roles and actions. You are the heroes and many thanks for your dedication and effort. This is the right time to build a momentum for this community. This is the right time to actually outline the importance of your effort. In all the member states, your community created and run information campaigns to keep communities safe and tackle myths and fears. You work remotely with innovative tools and physically as well with vulnerable households, elderly, homeless, children, families, persons with disabilities, and you provided support, material support, psychological support, and you also cared for families and children affected by domestic violence, abuse, or exploitation. And you did all this while taking the risk of being infected, facing long hours and unbearable workload and psychological distress. And again, big thanks for that. I couldn't, you know, not avoid saying that uh, in this particular session. But most importantly, you taught us a lesson while, you know, being in the connection between authorities and society that you, the social service providers, together with the amazing volunteers, you coordinated, you represent our strength. Therefore, one of our main priorities when we speak about resilience should be to ensure that we have a well-supported, appropriately equipped, empowered, and protected social service workforce. The question is how we are actually able to put this in practice so that at the next pandemic, we will keep our social workers with all the material and mental support. And not only in a case of you know, pandemic, you know, on a continuous basis, and how do we do that? Via investment, not expenditure, but investment, and not just all type of investment, but one that generates social impact alongside financial return. This is why I, I would really insist of mainstreaming social investment. And I think that this is not only manageable, but also desirable, especially when we speak about the public sector. For instance, the Recovering Resilience Facility, which will provide 560 billion euros for member states, for reforms and investment, it's, it's an instrument that has not been necessarily in the highlight right now. But I do believe that this is an investment that can generate the social impact investment in financial social, in financing social services and developing the, the social infrastructure. A reform of social services, which would actually include the designation of social workers as essential service providers, provision of support. We are- uh... there, Protective gear and training would actually provide the convergence that we actually need. Um, so while public responsibility in action is crucial, capital and expertise should also come from the private sector. And this is actually the best way we can actually bring them on board with the social investment skills window and supporting this particular thing. This is from my point of view, the most practical and accurate recognition of the importance of social workers and many roles they are playing from raising awareness to provide support for patients and survivors, not only in the midst of the epidemic and for our future, but constantly. So investing in social services is the right narrative to push forward in a non-ideological perspective, you know, and, pr and proving that this is actually, you know, contributing directly to a better uh, and safer EU. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, uh, uh, Dragos. Uh, thank you for your kind words addressed to the people that do the real work at grassroots level in, 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 in the cities, in the municipalities, uh, uh, in, in, in local communities. Uh, and also thank you very much for making clear that we should change the narrative from seeing the service as a cost element, uh, switching that to seeing uh, social services as an investment uh, in people and in the cohesion in our society. Uh, and indeed the European institutions uh, will make instruments available, uh, helping us uh, to, to, to make that shift in thinking uh, also. But a lot more has to be done and we count on you uh, to, to cooperate with you and with your uh, ample uh, committee in the parliament to, to, to make it happen. Dear colleagues, dear friends, uh, we are at the end of our uh, event together. In a minute, uh, Heather Roy will uh, uh, draw some conclusions. Heather Roy is uh, the Secretary General of Eurodiaconia, but before handing over to, uh, to Heather, I would like to repeat that uh, there is a lot of good information in the chat box. Many links were uh, made, uh, made available uh, in the chat box. And of course, there will be a recording of this uh, webinar that you can go back to uh, later on if you want to, to listen to certain paragraphs or, or uh, contributions uh, brought in by the different uh, speakers. Heather, uh, you are around since, since a while in, in the Brussels bubble. Uh, you know how the European machinery uh, works. What are your main conclusions? What are the conclusions that you would 
like to draw at the end of this uh, of this uh, webinar, not only on your behalf, of course, uh, only, but also on behalf of the the group uh, that prepared mm -hmm. the, this this event uh, this morning. Uh, Heather, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Luke. Um, when uh, Professor Vandenbroeke spoke, he said that we didn't need to convince each other about the importance of social services. And I think to some extent that's true, but I'm also not so sure about that because we seem to be able to say the right words. But when I'm listening today to our speakers from all the different countries across Europe, I'm asking myself, have we convinced ourselves of the need to have action now. Because when I was listening to um, Vice President Suica, she said very, very clearly that the European Commission is committed to supporting social services. But what we've heard from the speakers today is we haven't seen evidence of that support yet. And right now is when we need that support. We've heard about organisations who try to be independently funded, particularly those who have used the social enterprise model, who are part of our social economy, but they've lost that income just now. So what is going to replace that? And how is the European Union committed to ensuring that that support is there? We heard a lot about how um, social services are there and have been there before the crisis, during the crisis, and will be there after the crisis to mop up a lot of the problems that are going to be coming um, into our society. Where is the support going to come from to do that? The CRY funds and CRY plus do not mention social services. So where will that commitment to supporting social services come from? We heard today about the role of the, the funds such as the European Social Fund Plus in the future. But we're also concerned that we're hearing that the new Commission proposals, in light of the recovery plan, is going to actually reduce the amount of funding available in the European Social Fund. So will those funds be replaced and actually moved to the um, recovery fund and be available to social services? That was a very important point that's been raised. We can't have on one hand a commitment to supporting social services and on the other hand no funding or reduced funding in the main policy funds that the EU wants us to, to focus on. So we feel, I think, listening to everybody today, that the EU has been a little bit slow in responding to the needs of the social services sector. But we always have hope and today we have heard what actually needs to be done. We've heard about the need to have funding, the need to have investment in social infrastructure, in staffing, in technology, in digital ways of working. So all the answers that are needed have been presented today. What we need now is for the European Commission, for member states to actually take action now, not in a year's time when we have another report, but actually now prioritise social services in the allocation of funding at national level, prioritise um, employment of staff in any employment strategies. Join with us. You can see what we can do. And I think the last call that we have today is to look at the policy proposals that we have put forward from the organisations that have organised today, looking at recognition, urgency and resilience. If you look at those recommendations, if we work together on what's been shared today, then we can actually do something to ensure that this sector thrives, not just survives this uh, crisis. Luke, I think you're going to formally close us. Yes, thank you, uh, Heather. Thank you very much for your uh, very, uh, very nice uh, conclusions and, and, and wrap up. Uh, dear, dear colleagues, dear friends, dear participants, uh, the network of organizations that uh, organized this event has uh, 
uh, a policy paper uh, ready. Uh, we will maybe fine tune it a little bit, but it will be used for, for our future work. And I would like to ask my colleague Thomas to put it uh, in the chat box again so that people can find uh, that paper. And of course, all your proposals, your questions, your, your ideas uh, will be used by these European networks in, in the communication that uh, we will have and have constantly with the European Parliament and the European Commission. Dear participants, you took part in something exceptional. It is, as far as I know, the first time ever that the entire social services sector, uh, all the sub, uh, sub-sectors that we have in, in our very diverse social uh, sector, were in dialogue together with uh, policymakers and uh, authorities. Why? Well, because we live in very exceptional times. Um, but uh, giving up is not part of our DNA, so we will continue uh, this work. For us, Europe has to be social and uh, inclusive. I would like, on behalf of the organizers, uh, I would like to thank uh, all the speakers. Thank you for your, your excellent contribution. I would like to thank uh, the European uh, Parliament, the Vice, uh, the Vice President and the Vice President of the European Commission for their uh, promising uh, contributions. And of course, I would also like to thank all the participants for their active uh, work and, and contribution in the, in the chat box. Um, this is not the final step. This is just a very important step, ensuring that uh, our sector is recognized as being essential that we have long-term sustainability and short-term uh, support. Uh, why? Because we need it to be more effective and to do better what we want to do and what we have to do. A last word of thank you maybe to the communication teams of all the organizations that were involved and especially to uh, the colleagues uh, here in my ESPD team, Zoe, Rachel and Thomas for their uh, absolutely essential work to uh, make this uh, possible. Dear colleagues, you all did a great job. Uh, to all of you, dear participants, let's work together and let's make the European Union an even better place uh, to live. All the best to you and hopefully we meet again. Bye-bye.